All right, man. Today's Tuesday. It's April fourth. Welcome to the Dog Walk presented by Barstool Sports. Uh, here with Chief. Chief, how are you today? I'm doing great. I had an awesome weekend. Ready to get back to work. Feeling good about this topic. It's Masters week. Brains back. Brains back. Brain. I mean, I I, I got to reassess what the baseline is now, but it feels pretty good. I don't know if it's as good as it was three years ago or ten years ago, but based on the the current uh, thing I've been using, I feel like it's been good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good to hear. Mm-hmm. Um. So it is Masters week, like you said. Yep. So that's gonna we have a Masters inspired topic today. We do. Um, I'm excited for it. I am going to the practice round on Wednesday. So, it, uh, that, you I'm, excited? I'm good. I'm good for some history. Have you been? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, you told me you've been. That's I right. went. Um, so my dad, one of his biggest customers when I was a kid was Coca Cola. As you can imagine, Georgia Company, the Masters, they always had like hookups for yeah. that so there was one year my birthday is always right around the masters too so it was like a surprise get out of school we we're gonna fly down and uh we went i think on a thursday but it was like 2002 something like that but it's one of those things where it's like i i, I don't think i appreciated it as much at, at the time because you're i was like a punk kid <clears throat> uh but i love you know, like now I like look back way more fondly on it than I did in, in real time. I wish I had appreciated it a little bit more in real time because like Arnold Palmer was still playing. Like there, it was like it was like very cool, steeped in history, gorgeous. Like it 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 comes across. So you, you'll you'll see like the azaleas, the 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 sand, the whole the whole thing is just like this place is unbelievable. Yeah, no, I'm excited for it. It's one of those last places that is super exclusive yet somewhat attainable. In it's more cases, attainable now, I yes. think. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And kind of, that was by design, and we'll get into it. The guy who was like the founder and the visionary for the Masters is the guy Clifford Roberts, and that's who we're talking about today. Perfect. And when I say more attainable, like I, I, I was invited. I never, you know, I think they do like a lottery system too. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't, it's still super hard to get tickets. Yeah, and, and I, I know back in the day it used to be like you would pass them down in your will. So, like, if your family had tickets, let's say, from, like, the 50s, you, like, the grandmother or grandfather would, like, pass down the, the master's tickets to to their grandchildren or their son, you know, whatever it was. Yeah. Because once you no longer had them or if you did something to get them taken away, you can never get them back. They're so, out. I think it's a little easier now. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's still, like you said, it's a very exclusive. And it just, even if they open it up to the public the image has been so cultivated and again kind of by this guy clifford roberts i think it's always going to feel kind of exclusive yeah for sure it's not like i don't even know who they let in bohemian grove or the skull society it's all the like, same people <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. But like you know what i mean those are things that are like super yeah like you'll never know you'll never mm-hmm. be in there and that this is where it's like yeah you get a little could, could maybe get a little peek if you're lucky yeah and like you you hear it, you know, like Steve Spurrier plays there and it's like, a, you know, it's like when the elite of the elite and maybe Steve, like I think Steve Spurrier is in that <laughs> class. But like when you hear about, oh, my God, you played Augusta National. Like, what do you like? How was it? You know, like because so few people have been able to do that in yeah. the world. Even, I mean, even if you're a gazillionaire, it doesn't guarantee you that you'll be able to buy your way on to Augusta National. For sure. So and For you can't sure. buy your way in for a membership either it's just like it's like the most exclusive thing for sure and i mean speaking of uh the masters and it just reminds you of spring and a great spring clothing line is roback i'm wearing the hat right here uh roback activewear chief show them that polo if you're watching this is the polo for golf season in chicago it's unbelievable it's got everything you need you got the marquee from chicago theater the ferris wheel invented here hot dogs wrigley field marquee it is like and it, it it's like one of those shirts that's like super busy but doesn't feel like it. It's yeah. like it's just like a cool, very cool design. Everything Roback puts out is is fire. You know what? We had like an event at um at our Barstool Bar, like a sales event a couple of weeks ago. Did you notice how many of like the uh, executives from these other big brands were wearing Roback? Yes. <laughs> like all of them. Yes. It was crazy. But, I'm like, but, wait a second, what's going on here? But, but what I like about Roback is mm-hmm. the versatility. It's not yep. just like a corporate thing. Like you no. could go. Uh, you know, hit 
18 holes in the hoodie if you want. If totally. it's a little chilly, pop it on. Yep. Uh, they have a bunch of good stuff, guys. The so joggers are great. Out. Dave wears them basically every day. Yeah, the performance joggers. They're so comfortable. They're functional, versatile, comfortable. Uh, they check every box, really. And then the performance hoodies, like I was talking about, they're super soft. And uh, when you pair them with the joggers, like it's just the combo is mm-hmm. second to none. So get ready for spring with Roback. Use code DOG on Roback.com for 20% off your first purchase. Uh, that's R H O B A C K dot com. That's twenty percent off all performance hoodies, joggers, and polos with code DOG. Just give them a look. Mm-hmm. Highly suggest it. Um, all right, let's get into it. All right, so Clifford Roberts. So this guy, he is so like he is the Masters. Everything that you think of when you think of the Masters, good or bad, really came out of this guy's brain. And he has a tragic ending, which we'll get to. But he's like never discussed. Like there was an article about him um, in Golf Digest. I think it was came out last year. Then there was like you know like you'll find then you you, know, you Google search his name, and it's like when he died. He died in 1977. New York Times wrote a little thing about him, like basically a obituary, not like some great thing, um, you know. And he but he's like this mysterious guy because he designed this course. He was a Wall Street guy. He was a close friend and advisor to Dwight Eisenhower. Um, and then he he had this vision for what his golf club should be. And like I said, it's everything that you think of when you think of the Masters. And then um, it, he's just not talked about. You would think that there would be like statues and maybe a movie, like if the, the, the type of moving and shaking and the, and the ideas that he had. It like lends itself to a, to a documentary or movie. Nobody talks about him, so it's like, who is this guy? Why is this such a mystery? Why is it so hush hush around Augusta National? And and I feel like that that's what we need to get into today. And shout out Banks, our guy Banks, golf guy Banks, Baltimore Ravens guy Banks. He's the one who suggested this topic. Oh really? Yeah. Thank so you, he, Banks. Appreciate it. Yeah. So Banks, Banks is the man. Um. So anyway, so so this guy Clifford Roberts. He was uh, born in Iowa, uh, like 1894, and kind of a tragic he, upbringing to a degree. His mother, his mother was like the niece of the guy who wrote the uh, Star Spangled Banner, which is like a weird thing. I saw that. Yeah, and uh, she committed suicide when Clifford Roberts was 19. And so he's kind of off on his own and he gets into work kind of like a, a rollback situation where he's a clothes salesman. So he's like traveling around. He does extremely well and ends up working his way like into Wall Street being a broker. Takes a, takes a pretty big hit in 29 when the market crashed. But unlike many people, he bounced back. So he bounced back and got like a ton of money because he figured out how to like make money in the in the depression and another guy who didn't bounce back was this miami uh real estate developer who had bought the grounds from um at at augusta national and it was at (laughs) augusta national and i didn't know this which maybe you should have assumed but it used to be a, a plantation okay and like all there is this one particular like news newspaper newsletter uh, that was very, very highly regarded in the South. It was like this, like the most vile racist shit ever, like pre-Civil War came out of where Augusta National was. So like whoever was running Augusta National, they did peaches and trees and all this shit. They also wrote like the, like what you would imagine uh, people from Georgia writing pre-Civil War. And so anyway, so they, they this guy, the Miami developer, loses his shit in uh, the, the Great Depression, the crash of 29. So Bobby Jones, who is like the greatest amateur golfer ever, had gotten hooked up with our guy uh, Clifford Roberts, and they decided, hey, like let's buy this piece of property and let's make this um, spectacular golf course, which is Augusta National. And they spent some time building it, building it. Um, he becomes the chairman officially, Roberts, in 1934, and so it was kind of designed both of them together. And then they had put in an application to host the um, the U.S. Open, and it got rejected. So they were like, fuck these guys. Let's make our own tournament. 
and it was the Augusta National Invitational, and they had like the qualification process, which is still a thing. Like if you win an event, then you are automatically qualified to play in the Masters the following year. And so they were going to just have this like Bobby Jones wanted it to be like this kind of casual, like the best of the best get together on our course. And it's like it's like just a, a good time. Everybody's kind of equals. And Clifford Roberts was like, we should call it the Masters because like you've mastered a golf course. Like everybody come down to come down to Augusta. And Bobby Jones thought that was like a little too pretentious. And Bobby Jones was known as like this gentleman golfer, like never took never hair out of place, never took a step out of line, very humble. So then Roberts had told somebody that they wanted to call it the Masters. And then like almost through like word of mouth, that became the 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 name. Kind of like how we, you know, like the NCAA tournament's March Madness. Yeah. So it like it was the Augusta National Invitational. And then, like, the press started calling it the Masters. Other players started calling it the Masters. Fans, you know, everybody started just calling it the Masters. Like, fine, change the name. It's the Masters. So that was, I think that was in, like, 1939. And it was really this kind of <laughs> Robert's just like, like I said, everything you think about, you think about that, like, fine white powder in the sand traps, right? That was him. Okay, so he was traveling in North Carolina and saw that some of the sand and golf course around there had this color white. He's like, I gotta have that for Augusta. And so he's so he finds this this mill, this or mine rather. They're mining all sorts of other shit, mica, whatever. And he's like, and that was like a byproduct. It was just like it was like, we think it's trash. So he's like, Well, can I have it? They sent him thirteen rail cars. That's been the sand ever since that powdery, like almost like a confectioner's sugar is what it looks like. And so it's like that, the azaleas, the, the ponds. And he had this vision for how he wanted the masters to be portrayed. He was deeply distrustful of TV because he's like, TV is so powerful that they can shape the narrative of this tournament that we've in this place that we've been building. So while he was chairman, I don't know if this is still the case. He would only sign one year deals for TV contracts <laughs> one year only, because if you stepped on a line, it's always been with CBS. But if, if CBS stepped out of line, he would just be like, fuck you, I'm going to ABC. Um, fuck you, I'm going to NBC. And so he, because he would only do one year deal at a time, he could set exactly how he wanted the Masters be portrayed, which included like the words you're allowed to use on the broadcast when talking about the course of the people, um, the types of commercials you could run, how long the commercials could be. So Augusta, histor he, he didn't really care about money. He cared more about the image than the money. And so he had this thing where they had, um, he's like, you're not allowed to call fans fans. You can only call them patrons. You don't refer to them as fans because fans means fanatics. We don't have fanatics here because you're not allowed to run on the golf course. If you're a, a fan, you have to be, you're a, you're a gentleman, you just walk. So one time there was a guy in 1966, a broadcaster referred to the fans as a mob he gave him a five-year ban. He was like the, num oh, the number shit. one broadcaster for CBS. Referring to, it'd be like Jim Nance. Hey, like Jim, you said mob instead of uh, a group of patrons, you're banned for five years. Okay, so like that type of stuff. The, the US Open, the British Open, all these other majors that were on TV at the time, they made double the amount of money. Um, those courses, those events made double the amount of money that the Masters did. Well, it was on purpose because he didn't want a cluttered broadcast with commercials. So he said, you're allowed to run four one minute long commercials per hour of coverage. So he's just like, we're not doing that. Like we want it to be this pristine, this thing that people can sit and watch and just take it in and not have be interrupted by General Electric coming in at, you know, at the, for four minutes at a time. He's like, no, we're not doing this. We're doing things like very much our way. He also had the thing where it's like you could, you know, like you hit a shot off the fairway, you hit it, you hit it in the rough, right? Not at Augusta. There is no rough at Augusta. There's only a second cut. So like that, and he was like very particular about. So he had like this list of words that he would give to the to CBS to be like, this is how you are to speak of Augusta National. Is that fucking crazy? It's crazy, but you know what it reminds me of in a different way is uh, Vince McMahon was known for this. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know. That's yeah. shocking to me. Yeah, so WWE broadcast, there are, and maybe it wasn't this way the whole time, but there is a list of banned words. Okay. Like, he doesn't like saying, um, 
the strap or the or the belt, you know, hmm. like it's like it's a championship title, uh, you know, like shit like that. Okay, uh, I could I could look it up. Well, and he's he's in the news today too. Yeah, he just sold. Yeah, yeah, for like yeah. eight billion or something, right? Yeah, like the strap, uh, jobber. Just there's a bunch of bunch of words that he has banned yeah. regardless. Yeah, and it's like if if you're the king and it's your baby, and you're gonna you're gonna dictate as as best you can how the the course and the event are portrayed and it's it's all these kinds of things that led to this image and can you imagine if the usga had been like yeah sure we'll have the us open there it probably never is a masters Mm -hmm. because you those are rotational events every every year it's a different place every year so if augusta was just like one of those places that it would go to then there is no masters. There is no, you know, green jacket ceremony. This, this grand, illustrious, you know, steeped in tradition event that kind of like everybody. Even if you don't like golf, you kind of look forward to the masters just because it's, I don't know, it's the beginning of spring and, and uh, and th- that it was like a, a hair decision by USGA could have like killed the masters as we know it right from the start if they had just awarded them the U.S. Open instead yeah. of being like, well, fuck you, we'll just do our own tournament yeah. and we'll have it here every year. It's the only turn, the only major that's the same place every single year. See, like this guy being so neurotic, also helped it become what it is. Totally. I mean, that is what it is. Mm-hmm. It's it's his it's his thing. Hey, before we continue, Chief, let's talk about Manscaped. Manscaped is here with a deal you can't pass over this Easter season. They've got the tools to give you the beautifully decorated eggs of your dreams. Ooh. It's time to put all your eggs into the perfect basket with a performance package. 4.0 by Manscaped. Inside this ball care bunny basket, you'll find their lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, the Weed Whacker 2.0 ear and nose hair trimmer, the Crop Preserver ball deodorant, the Crop Reviver toner, performance boxer briefs, and a travel bag. That is a haul. Dude, it is, Swamp Ass season is here. Yes. It's dude. around the corner. Yes. You know, like you got to have this stuff taken care of. Manscaped has everything for you. Uh, like you said, you want to be trimmed up. It's, it's just about summertime. It's about to be humid. You got to get. Uh, with Manscaped. And here's the thing, too, okay? The Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer is an elite electric trimmer, it says, mm-hmm. because it has a proprietary advanced skin safe technology that's designed to trim hair on loose skin. Yeah, you know what that means. Yes. Yeah. You know what that means? <laughs> yeah. And it's legit. It is definitely it legit. It is legit. Like, this isn't just like, oh, yeah, like, what the fuck's so good about Manscaped? Like, it's just another. Bro. It's just a razor. It's not. And that's not an ad. You're not going to get cuts in the places you don't want cuts. I yes, promise you that. Exactly. Uh, I remember hearing that from a buddy of mine who was like, dude, like they have this technology. This is before they did ads. Yeah. Before I was really with Barstool. And I was like, what? Really? And it's legit. So yep. go check it out. Uh, save 20% off and free shipping with the code dogwalk at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with code dogwalk at manscaped.com. Hop into the best deal of the year with Manscaped. All right. Let's get back into the show. One more here, too, about. Uh, wrestling, not mm-hmm. to make it about Vince McMahon. No, it's fine. You could, could do a whole other pot on himself. Yeah. But he there he doesn't like them to be called pro wrestlers or wrestlers. What does it call? They are WWE superstars. Oh, yes. So it's like it goes super deep. Yeah, super so deep. Every yeah, every every word is carefully. I mean, I'm sure he like has thought about that endlessly. Oh, yeah. You know, for sure. And same same thing with this guy. For sure. And you know, and this guy liked to rub elbows with like the best and brightest and the most powerful people in the world. And he used them. And he, that was like the, the thing they say about him is that he had money, but he always wanted power and he never really cared about money. So, so he really knew how to shape a narrative and how to get, get in with, you know, powerful people. So, you know, they, they had a, a private airport built uh, in Augusta and he would always have, you know, CEOs from around the around the world and he would you know he would invite them and it was like hey like the masters is growing and growing but it's really only a thing in America so he would you know put out not even press releases but just like talk to the right people at the Daily Mail or London Times or these different big big established papers around the world to write these and he would invite them down come check out our thing and then he would like walk them around so they would go back to England and France and Germany and Scotland and write these uh, reviews of Augusta National. So it became like an international destination. And 
so they that that was always he was always thinking about how to make it more grand how to make it more uh prestigious and so he and he liked having all these ceos because they had private planes so there was a year where um the president of the usga was like hey like i can't I, i'm stuck i can't get get to uh won't be there for the green jacket ceremony he's like hey, give me 20 minutes sees who's around like hey is your jet here i need you to fly to north carolina to pick this guy up and bring him back and then cause i think it was like daughter was having a baby there's like some kind of controversy but he was like we need to have the head of the usga here for the green jacket ceremony because it just makes us look good in the world of golf so take your jet go get him and bring him back and they did so he just loved being able to like wheel and deal and have powerful people around him and that extended all the way to the president of the united states eisenhower was like his boy like he became Eisenhower's like one of Eisenhower's chief financial advisors, like for his personal finances, but he advised him on all sorts of shit. He was like, they didn't agree on everything all the time, but like he was instrumental in picking Nixon as his VP. And then Nixon had some scandal after the election. I think it was in like 52 where he was like, you gotta get rid of Nixon. And it was like a discussion <laughs> between this guy who's claimed the fame as Augusta National, a great claim to fame, but doesn't exactly put you in like the inner circles of a president, you wouldn't think, but it did. And uh, so he was, and then they, there was, he would always talk about, and I think it's like on a plaque somewhere that Eisenhower visited Augusta National 28 times during his presidency. Like the guy just fucking loved Augusta National. It's probably just a short flight from uh, DC to Augusta. So that was like, he was in tight, tight with, with Eisenhower, well, world famous general, and a huge, like a hugely like popular president. And yeah. it was like his boy was Clifford Roberts. Well, there's that story about the tree, right? What's the story about the tree? Eisenhower's tree. Well, yeah, I know he has a pond and a hole. I'm not sure if he has an actual tree too. Uh, well, I'm sure there, I mean, like everything is named after somebody. Yeah, there's an Eisenhower tree. It has its own Wikipedia page. Oh, no shit. Yes. It was a, a loblolly pine located on the Augusta National Golf course in the 1950s, it was named after a President Eisenhower who unsuccessfully lobbied to have it taken down <laughs> after, after it interfered with his golf game. Due to its size, history, and location on a prominent golf course, it is considered iconic of the Augusta Golf Course, one of the most famous trees in American golf. Well, there you go. Um, yeah. In February 2014, the tree was removed after suffering extensive damage from a major ice storm. That's, that's a shame. That is a shame, but pretty so cool. Eisenhower finally got his wish. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, but yeah. So that w that was, you know, and it's like the underbelly is is from him as well. So Augusta has always been known as like a very racist place, and that came. There was a quote attributed to Clifford Roberts that said, "As long as I'm alive, all the golfers will be white." and all of the caddies will be black. So back then, and I didn't know this, but if you look at old clips pre-1983, which is when they finally changed the rule, all the caddies were black. So it was the only place where you weren't allowed to bring your own caddy. So now it's like Tiger Woods has his guy, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, no, no. You're coming to play our course, we're gonna give you a caddy. And it was always you know, a black guy from the neighborhood. Um, and so it's like just steeped in like racism. Like you guys are here to serve us. Like you're the caddies, we're the players. And he, his reign was as chairman was 1934 to 1976. Well, it was 75 was the first time that like the color barrier was broken because they had these, um, you know, you could qualify. You win a tournament, you're in. So they, he had done other things to block different guys from getting in, exemptions, whatever. This one he like couldn't deny. This guy, Lee Elder, qualified by winning some tournament uh, at the, you know, the year prior. And Elder felt so unsafe there that he, he like traveled with like a group of like 10 guys, uh, would switch houses every day so people wouldn't know where he was. And was like, I always have to be, like, be near people that I trust because he was getting like so many death threats as the first black guy to play at Augusta National, and like this is, you know, this is still the South, right? This is this is the South, and the, you know, this guy was 30, 40, he was all during, you know, civil rights, Jim Crow, like this guy was probably 
big fan of Jim Crow is what it is what it sounds like. And then they didn't uh, admit an African American member until 1990, and uh, it was this t- television executive. But it's like you know, so the civil rights laws when I think went into place in like 65 or 66, and so you couldn't do like the separate but equal. It was like we're integrating, and Gus Nash was like, no, we're not. And it came from that's what this guy uh, Clifford Roberts wanted. He wanted it this way, so he was. You know, he had he was this great visionary, but he was also like a you know supreme supreme uh, racist, <laughs> and and I guess Bobby Jones, you know, kind of the same way. And these are guys born in 1894 and 1902, and you know it's but it, there's definitely some some serious strike marks against their against their record here because it was it was like the least inclusive institution in America for, for a long time. They finally got their first female member, which was, um, oh, what's her name? I'm blanking on it. She was a national security advisor to Bush, Condoleezza Rice. Condoleezza. And she, it was her and another woman were given memberships in 2012. So we're talking like 11 years ago was when it was finally like, quote unquote, fully integrated. And it was, it was, wasn't because they wanted to it's because they were getting pressure from advertisers and the usga and players and everything else they finally were just like fine but that was that was the way it was and it was because clifford roberts uh wanted it that way and, and then he got to a point um after he stepped down as chairman where he got very sick he had cancer he had like a spine disorder that he lived with for like 30 years so you know this is like a very proud guy um Proud, but not like ostentatious, I would say, because he he also had a quote being like, life's too short to worry about what to wear. So he had like this rotation of blue suits. He wore a blue suit every day and he had 24 uh, ties, but they're all exactly the same. So he's like, I'm, I, I wear one thing, which I kind of like. I kind of like the idea of not nice that. uniform. Yeah, basically yeah. like a nice uniform. And so 1977, September, he goes and gets himself clean shave, fresh haircut, brand new pajamas, walks out to the par three course, single shot pistol, does the same thing as his mother, kills him right, kills himself right on, on the par three course and leaves a note, um, kind of apologizing to who his, it was then his third wife. And, uh, and then he had his medical records with him, which he was like, I have like, Ter- terrible terminal cancer cancer like I can't, he like struggled to like get out of bed and stuff and he was just like miserable with his illness so he just decided like I, this is my this is where i want to die this is how i want to do it my mother did the same thing checking out and and took his own life that's it. right right on the course Jeez. and i think that's part of why it's like such a grim it's like there's nothing grim about augusta unless you look for it and so i feel like augusta just tried to like bury this and sweep it away and and uh he did it he did it uh in the middle of the night because he wanted the groundskeepers to be the first ones to find him and not like a member so uh, and he said i guess all this in, in his note and uh so then he you know he had substantial money um millions and millions of dollars from being the chairman of and co-founder of augusta national and so he left about half of that to his third wife the other half went to charities aimed at controlling the growth of the world's population. Cause he's like, this is going to be a big problem. This is population growth. So that's fucking creepy. If you ask me, Wow. and then I'm sure there's nothing that links this, but it's something that popped in my head. Georgia Guidestones. Yeah. I was literally going to say, yeah, Georgia so Guidestone that's, guy. it's uh, it's like an hour and a half. Georgia Guidestones are about an hour and a half from Augusta national. And, uh, I was like, hmm, maybe, and those were built two and a half years after his death. So I don't know how long it would take to build the guide stones with this giant monolith with all these inscriptions and talking about limit the world's population of 500 million or whatever, 500 million. I think that's it. And um, <laughs> so I, it's just like one of those things where it's like no one knows who who paid for and who did the Georgia guide stones. Maybe it was this guy. I don't know. But uh, but very, very strange story. He also like wrote a memoir. Okay. 
and he got it published because he was friends with the publishing house CEO and the people who have read it say that there's nothing in it. There's like 200 pages of just absolute nothing except for him, like talking about who came to his 80th birthday party. And that was it. Really? Yeah. Like he was just like, cause he was like still like a very reserved person. He's like a mystery. And, uh, so there's like very little footage, even though he's the chairman. Right. And they've been broadcasting that thing since 1956. And it's, it's always had like this prestige. There's like three minutes of video that you can find on him. It's on YouTube. He had a very weird kind of monotone way of speaking, but it's just like, he was very content to be the guy pulling the strings behind the scenes and not be like the face of it, even though it was his, his brainchild. Yeah, it was all him. Yeah. Him and Bobby Jones and he and Bobby Jones had like a big falling out, but then you can't really get to the bottom of that either. So it's, it's like, he's just a guy who is just shrouded in mystery with a tragic ending and some pretty like the visionary of it is incredible. Then he just had a lot of bad shit though, too. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. The interesting slash dark history of Augusta National. Dark, yeah. 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 That's really kind of what it is. is. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that, you know, everybody's got two sides to them to a, to a degree. And this guy certainly, certainly did. Yeah. That was interesting. Yeah. It was an interesting tale, I guess. Because I didn't know. You just think like, oh, that's. Sometimes you just think like, oh, how did that get there? Like, yeah, that. Someone, well, and it's, you know. especially us, like it's been there. It's been such a thing for our entire lives. For sure. Where I'm sure if you talk to like my dad, you know, so if my dad, he says he, he remembers what I can't, I can never remember my dad's age, but he says he can remember watching every single Super Bowl. So that's kind of how, so if first Super Bowl is in like 66, mm-hmm. you would think the Masters was on TV then for 10 years. I wonder if. You know, it still had, if it had that level of prestige, even during the first television broadcast. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's just, you know, like, how did Wrigley become ingrained in a neighborhood? You know, that just shit's like, oh, it's there. Yeah. How did it, how did. Got to get Dylan on that one. Yeah. How did it have to become so exclusive and how did it become so, you know, the way it is. Right. And it's just, it's like this kind of weird history. Yeah. That's it. Right, there's nothing then. really around Augusta. And they talk about, you know, there's that famous, like, Ray's Creek, okay? Well, everything is so manicured at Augusta National. Like, Ray's Creek looks like it was placed there on purpose. It wasn't. Obviously, it's just a, it's a creek. And if you follow that creek five miles down, down the creek, it runs right through a trailer home. Like, literally. Like, it's Ray's Creek from Augusta National, the prettiest place on earth, five miles away from, like, a legit trailer park. Really? Yeah. And it's just, like, that's that's what's around Augusta National. Mm-hmm. It's, like, this beacon in the middle of kind of, like, this poor rural area. Yeah. So. All right, then, Chief. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, that's it. The dark history of Augusta National. Thank you guys for listening. Thank Clifford you for Roberts. watching. Clifford Roberts. Clifford uh, Roberts. We will see you all tomorrow.